Hey guys, you all are early. Turth, hi Liz. Liz, you are always on time. Suit here, hi guys. We're gonna be starting in a few minutes. Hi, Nicole, Shawnee, Michael, Chavez, Colette. Hi, Akisi. Hi, Cynthia. Wow, you guys are really excited about this interview. I'm glad. Gosh, a lot of you. Okay. Love listening to her. Oh, she's a breath of fresh air and keeps. Okay, so you guys already know my guest today. I love that. I love that. Um, okay, who was that that just said, Sudhar, you said I'm in Florida despite the hurricane. Ian did not want to miss his talk. Well, stay safe, Sud here. You could always listen to the interview later, but you don't want to mess around with hurricanes. I used to live in Miami, and that is something that you do not want to play around with. So if you have to get to a safe place, please do so, and you can pick up our talk a little bit later. Okay. All right, everybody. Okay, so there's enough of you in here now. So we want to we uh, want to get started. I'm so glad that you are joining me today because I am so excited about our guest today. I have been trying to do an interview with her probably for about I don't know. It's it's got it. I think it's going on a year. Okay, but she's really busy, and she was able to carve some time out today to talk to to me and to give us all some great advice. Um, and so I'm, I'm just very excited. Okay, so um, in the Fortune 500 companies, okay, you guys know the Fortune 500 uh, company list, there are only two black female CEOs, all right? I brought to an interview back in 2020 with a good friend of mine, Rosalind Brewer, uh, who we, grew up in Detroit together at right across the street from each other. We went to high school together. We went to college, Spelman College together. Um, I brought you an interview with her back then in 2020. She was the COO of Starbucks. Now she is the CEO of Walgreens Boots Alliance. And today, the other one, one out of uh, two, out of 500 companies, she is absolutely Amazing, amazing. Um, to Shonda Brown Duckett, president and CEO of TIAA, Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association of America. That is a Fortune 100 company, financial services company. They provide financial planning and retirement services to millions of people in higher education and nonprofit sectors. Tashonda is absolutely remarkable. She is remarkable. Let me just give you a little bit of her bio. Um, she, she'll tell us more, obviously, about her role as CEO of TIAA, which she joined in 2021. After serving as CEO of Chase Consumer Banking, where she oversaw a banking network of more than $600 billion in deposits, and 50,000 employees. Uh, previously, she was CEO of Chase Auto Finance and National Retail Sales Executive for Chase Mortgage Banking. Earlier in her career, she was Director of Emerging Markets at Fannie Mae. She serves on the boards of Nike, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, uh, Sesame Workshop, a number of other organizations. President Biden appointed her on his board of advisors on historically black colleges and universities. She'll talk about that and what their mission is. She founded the Otis and Rosie Brown Foundation in honor of her parents to recognize and reward people who use extraordinary means to empower and uplift their community in extraordinary ways. And as a person who has a finance or rather has a um, nonprofit, a foundation myself, I, I'd love to hear about people who are giving back. So please welcome everybody, round of applause for Miss Tashonda Brown 
docket. Hello. <laughs> How are you, my friend? I am wonderful. I mean, you know, I'm sitting here like, who is this woman she's talking about? You know, I'm like, I'm jealous of me right now after that wonderful introduction. Well, you should be. Uh, you have touched a lot of people. And I don't know if you've been reading the comments. I mean, there are a lot of people who are already familiar with you, familiar wow. with your work. They are eager to um, look. They're eager to hear what you have to say about how we can all make our lives better. Uh, so let me let me start by asking. And I promise I won't keep you over time. But what, what is on the agenda today? Other than uh, the interview with Sean Robinson, what's on your to do list today? Oh, wow. Um, it's pretty busy. But first, before I do that, I do just have to acknowledge you. This is fantastic. And congratulations to you and all that you have done, are doing, and will do because you too are an impact maker. So Thank I just you. really wanted to take a moment to acknowledge you. Thank um, you. And so all much. Your success. Thank you. Um, but in terms of the agenda today, there's a host of different meetings. But if I had to theme it, um, it's talking about the business and ways that I can be a better leader. For mm -hmm. example, I have something that we call coffee and tea because people call me tea. And it's an opportunity for me to get proximate with my um, employees. And so today, right before this call, I had a group of employees, nine of them. It's not a big forum. And yeah. I just asked them, if you were CEO, what are the one or two things that you would just do already? Or what would be the one or two things that you would absolutely say, don't mess it up and keep? It's a mm -hmm. great way. Absolutely. And it's a great way, Sean, um, for, for me as a leader to stay proximate, but to also mm -hmm. hear themes. And I think that's important for leadership that if I'm speaking to executive assistants, which I had a coffee and tea with them, I've had it with RMs today or portfolio managers or people in different locations. You yes. start to see your themes, regardless of who they are or what level. But then you also see what are the things that matter to this particular group. And so it allows mm -hmm. me to get smarter um, and it allows me to also model the culture I aspire, which is making sure that everyone has a voice and know that ultimately I work for them, not the do other you, way around. Do you think that that is more important today, as we've heard so much about quiet quitting, people not feeling valued at work, feeling they're overworked and saying, hey, I'm just, you know, going to go and, you know, sit on the beach. Or do you find that it's even more important in this climate? I mean, I think it's always important because whether we're calling it quiet quitting as a name, there's always been, you know, moments in people's career that maybe they were retiring in place or, yeah. you know, they're calling in more because they just don't feel valued. Um, but clearly in this environment, it is as important. And for me, having the privilege to lead this company, it's mission one. And so I do think that the more leaders can get proximate, the more that we can spend more time listening, yeah. the more that we take the time um, to understand, here's what you should feel proud about. But then I also think it's a reminder that I ask people after every coffee and tea, you know, why did you join TIAA? Mm -hmm. Because just like a relationship that you've been in for a long time, you can sometimes question my why, um, yeah. because there's so many yeah. things that you focus on that may not be great. But when you take a moment and say, well, why are you here? You mm -hmm. allow people to fall back in love with what they do every day, what makes the company special, and to make sure that they know that their voice matters. And so I do think it's important. And I think it's important for us as leaders to do the skip levels, you know, to hear it straight from the people that are closest to our clients or the people that are farthest removed from us so that we can make sure that we're doing all that we can for people to love working here and knowing what we're here to do, but also see their role in it. So I need yeah. them here. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes. I've, I've seen a lot of uh, comments already about explain what TIAA, TIAA is. Um, and I want to get to that in just a moment. But I want to start really at the beginning about your childhood, where you grew up in Texas, right? You were born in New York, grew up in Texas. What was the childhood like? How far back do you remember? I mean, Otis and Rosie Brown are my oh. heroes, my Shiro and my hero. Um, and, you know, I'm the only girl. I grew up with my older brother, my youngest brother. Uh, we played a lot of sports. Uh, we had a lot of laughter. Um, but I would also say, you know, when I think about growing up, just like millions of families, you understood what financial insecurity 
meant. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say, you know, we were short on money, but we were long on love. Um, And so what, how that shaped me, I think growing up is that you see that when someone, in this case, my mom and dad did everything that they could, even when at times it wasn't sufficient. So they would sign us up for karate lessons and I didn't get past white belt, yellow stripe because it was financially hard. You yeah. know, my dad wanted to make sure I, I played piano. That lasted a few sessions. Um, and so they had, and they had big dreams for us. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes the money got in the way. But the lesson is that I saw that here are two people that did everything that they could to make a positive impact in our lives. And they absolutely did that. And Mm -hmm. how they made up for it was through our value system, through family, through faith, uh, to making sure that we were always humble. Uh, So that impacted my life. Um, The other piece I would say, Sean, is that I love sports. Uh, And so I grew up playing sports. My family played sports. Well, not my mom. My mom did not play sports, but my, my father and my brothers and I played sports. But that taught me the power of teamwork. They Mm -hmm. that taught me on any given day that taught me grit and tenacity. And so when I think about, you know, my upbringing, yes, financial insecurity was real. And I think that's why I'm on a mission to make sure that everyone can be financially secure, even in retirement, which is critical. And I know we'll get to that, but also the power of sports and understanding the power of team and the power of confidence and teamwork and grit, um, you know, really helped, you know, shape shape my life growing up. Did did you, were you a standout in math when you were in school? Did you really love numbers? Did you say, hey, you know, I understand the, you know, the, the lack, you know, right. of money, but how do I, you know, how do I turn this around? Or did it make you more curious about money and, and learning about math? Uh, I was okay. Um, you know, I was a good student, but uh-huh. I would say what got me into financial services, clearly the passion when I look back and understanding it firsthand in terms of financial insecurity, but the power of information, Inroads, Sean was my disruptor. Um, Inroads, as you know, is a program for minorities that get you exposure into corporate America. Mm-hmm. And so the reason yes. why I like power of information is because I believe that when you know something, share it freely. Mr. and Ms. Patterson told me about this program called Inroads. I never heard of corporate America. My dad worked in a warehouse and, and he was a, a, you know, he drove trucks and my mother was an educator. So corporate America and how to solve these problems was not yes. in my consideration set. But for Mr. and Ms. Patterson, the power of information. So Inroads is what exposed me to corporate America. And Sean, I have to tell you and everyone watching this story, Inroads was my disruptor, power of information. But in order to get the job, which I started my career at Fannie Mae, Mm -hmm. um, the company had to choose you. Well, you had to interview. Well, Fannie Mae at the time had a position for one internship, and this was in Dallas. And there was a woman by the name of Valerie Manning who interviewed me. She was a recruiter. She didn't have a big title. You do not get extra points for bringing in more interns. You have one job, one intern. So Sean, At the end, Valerie Manning went back to Fannie Mae and said, we found our intern. Her name is Sarah. But there's this other girl. I share this all the time because the power of advocacy should not just be reserved for people with big titles. Yes. Valerie Manning did not know that I would end up becoming a CEO. But whatever I said, she used her voice to say, but there's this other girl. And by her simply using her voice, Fannie Mae then said, then add the second intern. And I just think it's so important for us to understand that we all have the power of voice and we all have the power to make a positive change or make an impact. Valerie Manning is what started my career. Mr. and Ms. Patterson gave me information that disrupted my trajectory. And here I am now talking to you. I love the fact that you remember these names and that you... Um, you give them credit for the turning points in your Absolutely. life and that you give them, you, you pay homage to them because Absolutely. without them, it may be, you maybe would have achieved it, but it would have been harder. It would have taken longer. And they were the ones that said that they were going to take a chance on you. I love that. I love that. So tell me, what did you do at Fannie Mae and how did you rise through the ranks of Fannie Mae? 
Yeah, so I started um, interning, and then after I graduated from the University of Houston, I, I was afforded a full-time position and really moved around um, in different roles, which was able to give me exposure. And so I worked in affordable housing where um, I was able to put together programs for down payment assistance, et cetera, was able to see all parts of our country, including going into markets like Oklahoma and seeing Native Americans um, and fee simple land and just understanding different structures and how can you create programs that can provide access to home ownership. Um, I then moved into account management, which is where you were negotiating pricing and guarantee fees. So every few years, I happen to move into different roles. And yeah. so what I would share is that I didn't map out my career. Um, you know, I think what's important is that everyone has their own, you know, footprint, just like your own, you know, digital footprint is uniquely yours. For me, I showed up with a lot of intellectual curiosity. Um, I showed up, you know, talking to the administrative assistants who took me under their wing when I was young and helped me understand the culture and understand how to navigate, um, affirmed me. Uh, and there was no job that was too big or too small for me. And I wanted to make sure that whatever I did, I did it with excellence. And along the way, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to perform, but also fortunate enough to have people around me that would give me the shot. Uh, yeah. And once you get the shot, it's what you do with it. Um, and I would just say, you know, Sean, being open and recognizing that life doesn't necessarily move in the trajectory that you may have in your mind, but it doesn't mean that there's not the opportunity forward. So being OK, being uncomfortable, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. And I think those were those elements that if I think about my career trajectory, it was being open. It was being comfortable, being uncomfortable but also surrounding myself with people uh, at work, but most importantly, you know, the people around me, like my parents that would affirm me when I yeah. needed to be affirmed, when my confidence was not always there uh, to remind me who I am and to remind me that, you know, I am enough. And I think that's very important when you're navigating your career. So I just moved up. Uh, and then I would tell you I was in L.A., so I moved from Texas to L.A., which was an interesting experience for me working for Fannie Mae. Uh, but I wanted to get closer to the consumer. And no matter how much I loved Fannie Mae, given that it was in the secondary market, I couldn't get closer to the consumer. Uh, and there was a moment in time I was on Fannie, Fannie Mae Business and the CEO of the mortgage company at Chase uh, asked me a question. And so the art of the question can be your opportunity. And so that answer and a couple of other conversations ultimately led me to Chase. OK, I'm going to get we'll get to Chase in just a second. Let me say, take a step back for just a minute. You received your BBA from University of Houston yes. and then your MBA from Baylor University. Yes. Uh, I'd like for you to and then you went to the uh, is it Hankamer School of Business? Mm -hmm. For yes, my Hankamer. MBA, yes. Yes. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about your schooling. And how do you think it prepared you for the role that you have had, that you have today, and for the other jobs that you've had? No, I mean, you know, I'm fortunate enough. I truly enjoyed my experience at the University of Houston. Um, and I think how it prepared me was not just in the classroom, um, you know, attending a school that is very diverse attending a school where you had traditional students and you had people that were working and going to school, mm -hmm. um, being in a position where I joined a sorority. So understanding the power of sisterhood, being that I grew up with boys, uh, being the student regent. So I think I was the first woman or first African-American student regent at the University of Houston or one of the first, but having the opportunity to understand your voice matters as a student when it comes to policy. So what college life provided me was it allowed me to get beyond myself. It allowed me to be uncomfortable. Um, it allowed me to sometimes not do well. So understanding, you know, classes are tough or there's relationships that are tough, but, you know, keeping your eye on the prize. And so my experience was a really positive one um, from, the mo from the standpoint of it taught me a lot. It doesn't mean every moment was positive, but it taught me a lot. 
Um, but it also, I think, prepared me, not just academically, but prepared me on the things that really matter when you think about cultivating relationships, when mm -hmm. you think about, you know, understanding everyone has a voice in perspective matters and wanting to understand everyone's perspective uh, shaped me, uh, I think, in a, in a really profound way. And then, you know, receiving my MBA while I was working. So I was at Fannie Mae when I went to Baylor for my MBA, which was just fantastic because I was able um, to be in the classroom with executives. Um, I was able to be in a classroom with people that were mid-managers um, or just getting started. And so it allowed the conversation to not just be theory, but it yeah. allowed us to have real practical um, examples and use cases in terms of what we were all dealing with. And so being able to go to work and get my MBA, I found that I was much more focused um, and I found that I was much more um, in a position of understanding, you know, how these things really work and how I could apply it um, in business. And was it there that you decided or realized that finance, the world of finance was going to be your bread and butter, was going to be your career path? Well, really getting the job at Fannie Mae uh, is what led me down this path and working for a company where I really connected to the mission of home ownership really mm -hmm. resonated with me. And I think that really sparked my intellectual mind and curiosity, but also my purpose, my purpose of you know doing good and making a positive impact. And so mm -hmm. I think financial services connected the things that I'm very passionate about, but each moment just further unlocked what yes. that real passion is. But I think, you know, working at Fannie Mae and starting my career in financial services and then loving it is what really sparked it. All right. Let's uh, move on quickly to Chase. Tell us yeah. about your time there and how it shaped the person that you and prepared you possibly yeah. for the job that you have today. Yeah, I mean, my time at Chase was a, you know, phenomenal experience and it's always about the people. Uh, and the impact that you can make while you're in the seat. Um, and so while at Fannie Mae, I mean, at Chase, uh, I again came in uh, in mortgage, uh, then moved into becoming, uh, running a P&L, which was my goal, Sean. The goal professionally was I want to run a P&L. That's it. I didn't know it ended up being a trillion three. I just wanted to run a profit loss P&L. Okay. Okay. okay, we have a lot of like students watching us today. Tell us what the PL is. Well, so profit loss, it's managing the money. It's making decisions when it comes to revenue and growth um, and working directly with clients. Mm -hmm. um, and so to be responsible for the dollars, if you will, and having that accountability is something that was really important to me because you didn't see um, as many women and you didn't see as many people of color, you know, in that seat. And so at Chase, um, I was actually six months pregnant with my second child when I was asked um, or afforded the opportunity to run a PL. And the reason why I share this story, especially for women, um, is that the mental gymnastics were real in my head. So here I am, I have this opportunity to run a PL, to run a business. And I almost talked myself out of it. I'm talking to my boss saying, you know, I'm six months pregnant, right? You know, it's going to be a Schedule C. You know, you know, you know. And he's like, you're coming back, right? And so I just share that because sometimes that moment that you really want is also the moment that you can talk yourself out of because yeah. you may be a little afraid or it didn't happen the way you envisioned. But um, so Chase ran the PL, it expanded uh, to a broader geography and mortgage, and then it was the entire country. Um, and then I was tapped to become the CEO of Auto. And that was a, a, a fantastic experience. And what I would say about that, Sean, is going into the auto industry where you're a CEO, you're in an industry that may not be as diverse, gender, mm -hmm. age, race. Uh, so you sometimes can say, you know, should that be for me? But what I can tell you is when I left, I left with a ton of friends in mm -hmm. lifelong relationships that on the surface, I would say we didn't have that much in common. And yes. so I think that's just an important insight. And I also think that as leaders, sometimes we will say we want, you know, someone of color to run a business because that's where the growth is or that's where this is. But I would also offer up that even if you're in an industry where maybe there's not as many women or minorities doesn't mean that you should not lead that industry. Um, and that's what I had the benefit of, of leading an auto. And then it turned into moving into the consumer bank. 
uh, in becoming the CEO. So my time was fantastic. Having a leader like Jamie Dimon and Gordon Smith and others are just some of the most phenomenal leaders uh, of our time where I was able to be a student. But I also believe I was able to make impact. And that to me is when I left Chase, uh, it's not what I did, but it's how I made people feel and hopefully yeah. the impact that I was able to make in people's lives. You obviously had a very positive experience when you were at Chase, you know, like all of us who have um, been through companies where not many people look like us. Sometimes you are reminded that people see you differently. Yeah. How did you handle some of those challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think like many of us, working in corporate America or being a CEO or an executive wasn't the first time I was the only in the room. Yeah. You know, it, it, you didn't just wake up and have that experience for me. For me, there were many moments where I was the only brown girl on a soccer team, or I know what it was like to not be invited to the birthday party. And it was just because of my skin color and my parents had to scrim and scrap to throw me a birthday party to show that I mattered. And yeah. so those moments along the way, I would say prepared me. But it's also, Sean, that I say publicly, you know, I rent my title, I own my character. And mm -hmm. so knowing that when I might be the only in the room, I still have a voice um, and that I believe my voice is necessary and required. And there's times where I had to take a deep breath. Even today, there's moments I'm the only in the room and I have to say, OK, Shirley Chisholm. OK, <laughs> Grandma. OK, Sean, I'm bringing my girls to the room. So. I, I can do this. And so for me, it's recognizing that I'm never the only in the room by myself because there is a village, there's shoulders of which I stand on that's in the room with me. And yeah. once I can get my head in the right space for that, I know I belong and I know that I have something of impact to share. Yes. Uh, you obviously have a very positive outlook, but Tashonda, I know there were some times when you had to say, look. Yeah. Yeah. How did you yeah. handle that? <laughs> I mean, listen. <laughs> listen. Right. I mean, there's there's lots of moments. I mean, I remember, you know, when you are um, in the room and you have clients, you know, assume that everyone in the room is is the leader, not you. And you just yeah. have to say, wait for it, wait for it, because they have to come to me eventually. Um, right. You know, I know. Uh, you know, moments when I was in business in a remote part of our country and um, a man came up to me and uh, was made me very uncomfortable, let's just mm -hmm. say, um, to where I went back to work questioning what did I do wrong, even though I had my clear pearls on and my navy blue suit and my bob, what did I do wrong? Um, and so there are moments where... Uh, you recognize that people see you how they want to see you, not for yeah. who you are. Um, but again, I just think for me, this isn't our first rodeo. You yes. know, it wasn't just in corporate America. You know, it's it's a microcosm of society that, you know, I have to endure. And so when I have those moments or when, you know, I'm home and I'm questioning, you know, am I good enough? I'm questioning why. I'm questioning, you know, why do I, you know, why do I see those microaggressions? Or why, you know, people that I thought, you know, really cared, you realize that they're saying other things or they're trying to create a counter narrative when you're just trying to make impact. Absolutely. Yeah. But I will say, Sean, I'm a positive person because we have to be. And my mother taught me that when people are coming for you, they basically sent the mail to the wrong person. So return it to sender. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to own it. It doesn't mean that I don't have my moments where I break down. It doesn't mean that I've not had my moments where I've cried a many nights, but it does mean that I got back up. And I think that comes from, you know, my culture, my faith, but also recognizing that no one said it was going to be easy, but we're going to make progress. We will yeah. make progress. You were appointed a CEO of TIAA in 2021 last year. Um, first of all, explain like there, I can see from the comments that there are many people who are familiar with TIAA, but many people have never heard of it before. Tell us what the company does. No, it's it's a great question. Well, TIAA is over 100 years old. It was founded by Andrew Carnegie, who realized that educators uh, who educated some of the world's brilliant minds were retiring in poverty and not with dignity. And so the TIAA, our mission is really to make sure 
that people have secure retirements. And we do that by providing access to guaranteed income. We also have Naveen, which is our asset manager, asset owner for the company. So we have over a trillion dollars of assets under management. Um, what this really means in, in the day in the life is you are working at a university. We primarily serve um, higher ed, healthcare, not-for-profit sectors. Um, but when you are working at a university, you have your benefits. Um, and when you have access to your benefits, we want to make sure that on your menu is guaranteed income, which mm -hmm. means you have access to dollars that you cannot outlive. And we think that's very important. And so at our core, we're a retirement company. We're very much focused on people being able to retire with dignity, which goes back to the founding of, you know, with Andrew Carnegie. Uh, and so that is what we do. Uh, and it's something that I get to wake up every single day uh, knowing that the work that I do along with my 15,000 associates are helping people have a secure retirement. And the assets that TIA, the TIAA holds, what is the number, the financial number of the assets that TIAA holds? It's over a trillion two of assets under management. Wow. Um, so it's, it's a Fortune 100. Uh, it's the second largest guaranteed income provider next to Social Security. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, I think about, you know, my parents, I think about Otis Brown that did not contribute to his 401k. He did not tap into a benefit. Um, mm -hmm. And all he had was his pension and that was not enough. And so I get to wake up every day thinking about the millions of Americans that may have access and are not connecting that there's a benefit for you. But I yeah. also think about those who don't um, and making sure that TIA is playing a role in providing secure retirements for everyone. And so what are your biggest challenges on a daily basis? Uh, what, what, what is your basic mission? What is your basic mission? Yeah, in terms of our overall strategy or just yeah. in the... Yeah. Well, yeah. well, yeah, what is, um, you know, so when you, I was asking you what's on the to-do list today, you were yeah. saying talking to employees, but what is, you know, when, when you came in, you wanted to really put your stamp on the company, exactly. assuming. And yeah. so what is, what is it that you hope to accomplish? Yeah, there's three things. Um, one, I want us to be a leader in lifetime income, making sure that every American has access to guaranteed income, um, in addition to Social Security, knowing that they need that security. So that's yeah. thing one. Thing two is to delight the clients. Um, you know, in everything that we do, you have to earn it. And I don't want to meet the client expectation. How do we delight them? We're just making sure that we're making us one of the easiest retirement companies to do business with. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, strengthen how we operate. And so that means, are we investing in the right technology? Um, how do we make sure that we're retiring technical debt? Um, how do we make sure that we're investing in capabilities uh, digitally so that our participants can engage with us? So being a leader in lifetime income means you are delighting the clients every day or you can't be a leader. And in yeah. order to delight the clients, we have to strengthen how, how we operate, which is all about a focus around technology um, and digital. And clearly underpinning that chassis is our people and making yeah. sure that we're always attracting and retaining talent and listening to the needs of our associates. I was talking to your team before this interview, and one of the things that they said you were passionate about was the fact that you know many Americans are not actively saving for retirement, and yeah. those who are saving are not hitting the goals that they need to comfortably retire. What do you think the keys are in changing that? Yeah, I mean, let's start with the problem that we have to solve. And so here's just a few anchor stats. 40% yeah. of all Americans run the risk of running out of money. 40%. 40%. 40. When you disaggregate the data, 83% of Black Americans in retirement do not have enough. So how are we going to close the gap when the middle generation is having to support mom and dad yes. may have to support their nieces and nephews or their own children, and they're trying to you know, live their life? it gets really tough. And yeah. so there's a real problem that we have. And so what do we need to do? Um, well, one, there's an access gap. One third of workers do not have access to corporate retirement plans, mm -hmm. your 401k, your 403b. So we need to work um, to make sure that more companies, more businesses can provide a retirement plan to their employees. Mm -hmm. There's also a savings gap. As you know, we're not saving enough. And so how do we make sure 
that we're really engaging with people. And clearly it's tough when you're trying to pay the bills and all the things that we have to do, but can you break it down? Can you not get the venti latte and get the grande instead? You know, how do we really make sure that folks understand that we have to start early? And mm-hmm. then lastly, like I talked about there's a guarantee gap. And that's a problem because even when you think you saved enough, you may outlive your retirement. Four of 10 girls in the future could live to be 100 years old. And yeah. so how do you make sure that you have a piece of your retirement like Social Security that you can't outlive? But the real message that I would share with, with your you know viewers is that retirement seems like a long, like, I don't need to be worried about that. Yes. However, However, it's the decisions that you make at 20, at 30, at 40, that will determine, will you be in that 40% category? So one simple tip, which is what I did, one simple tip, your first job, your very first job, before you get the check, max out on your 401k or 403b plan, because that's your baseline before you receive it. And if you're on this call, take action, go and say, you know what, can I contribute a little bit more? Many times your company is matching, but what are the things and what are the actions you can take today to make sure that you're not transferring that debt to, you know, your, your children or to someone else that you can be in control to have a secure retirement. That's great advice for the 20 year olds. Let's talk to the 40 year olds, the 50 year olds, the 60 year olds, the 70 year olds. What, you know, is what should we be doing, especially during this time? And let me just ask you, do you think we're going into a recession, Tashonda? I I mean, I think there's a strong likelihood. You know, my my hope and what I'm seeing is that it it won't be severe. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that, you know, we we could be entering a, a recession. And so I do think that it's very important for all of us to take note of our balance sheet um, yeah. and to really make sure that we're being thoughtful um, and conservative during this time, but also making sure that we don't act irrational. You know, this is a time where you want to stay invested because if history proves out, you know, trying to time the market, you end yeah. up you know, leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. But I do think it's important. But to answer your question around the 40 year olds and the 50 year olds, Um, You know, I think understanding that everything is more expensive these days and that it's very hard. Um, But I do think that what we can do is take a hard look to say, well, instead of getting my hair done every three weeks, I'm going to stretch it out a little bit more. New growth never hurt anybody, Sean, you know, (laughs) Um, or thinking about we're now going gray. Exactly. I'm not going to the every two weeks to dye the hair. That's exactly right. And so I do think that looking at where we are and say, what can I do and what can I reprioritize? I'm not talking about the basic things that we all struggle with. I'm talking about the things you don't even think about, you know, whether it's getting the venti or whether it's getting the nails, all those different things that you can do and say, you add that up, that's $50, that's $100. And how can I then say, what can I do in an intentional way if I have my second job or my side hustle? That's going to be the money that I use to make sure that I have a secure retirement because that 40 year old or that 50 year old, the question that we're asking ourselves is I want to transfer wealth, not debt. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. And I want to make sure that I can enjoy the next chapter of my life and be able to do it in a way that's on my terms. And so I think it's never too late to get started. um, But I think the goal is to get started. And don't say, you know, when I get to $500 or $300 or 200, you can start today putting that money aside for $50 or $10, get started is the most important thing. Let's talk about mental health. Um, I saw an interview that you did and in which you said, you know, the myth of having it all is something we should just not even concern ourselves with anymore. Nobody can actually have it all. Tell me your feelings about that. And just in this post pandemic ish world that we're in about mental health and and talking about your mental health and dealing with issues that are very real for men and women. You know, mental health is real. And, you know, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we've all hit our low. I know I hit a low 
during the pandemic, you know, navigating a business, raising my children, um, dealing with social justice and the murder of George Floyd and the wildfires on the West Coast. Um, it was heavy and it was a lot. And I think it what we have to be okay with, and I've said this publicly, is it's okay to not be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and to understand that everyone, everyone hits their bottom. And so I think we have to continue to be open and talking about mental health, um, making sure that people understand that we all go through some form or fashion, but there's a lot of resources that are available. We need to talk about it. It should not be taboo. Girlfriends should get together, guys as well. We have to be open um, to talking about our, our, our mental health. So it's absolutely important. And I do think we have to give ourselves permission to take a breath. Yeah. Just take a breath. You know, I think, you know, with everything that's going on in the world, we get so heavy um, and it ends up putting us in a state where we just just are frozen. And so I think it's OK for us to say, I'm not OK. I need mm -hmm. to take a breath. And I think it's more important than ever to make sure that we're connecting with one another and not carrying that by ourselves. When I talk about uh, you can't have it all, what I say is that I don't believe in work-life balance. I think that is a lie, get it out of our vocabulary. Um, I think, and given my financial background, Sean, I think we should live our life like a diversified portfolio. Yeah. I think that what we do is we should allocate everything that matters to us. The reality is there's only 100%, not 150. Um, mm -hmm. And so what I do is I say, what matters to me? I'm a mother, I'm an executive, I'm a philanthropist. I need my me time, my sisterhood, and I allocate. The truth is my children don't get 100% of me. So we have to acknowledge the truth. They get about 30%. But by knowing that allocation, I give them 100% of me within that allocation, which means I'm more present more than ever than when I told myself I could do everything. And yes. the point- You're not talking to your kid while you're on exactly, the phone. Exactly, because I now told myself the truth, right? Yes. When you think that you can be superwoman, you then think that I don't have to be as present because I'm doing And the reality is when I told myself, they don't get all of my time. So be present. But the point here, and, and the reason why I want to share this, is that just like markets, we're experiencing market volatility, life will give you volatility. Sometimes yes. you have to short the stock, Sean. You have to short the stock. <laughs> yes. But if you live your life like a diversified portfolio, everything that matters to you is in it. And over time, you will outperform this thing called life. And I think for me, I can have it all over time within the allocation that I give it. And that, to me, is how I can live a joyful life. Hallelujah. I love, love, love that you said this. This is the first time anybody has ever said this during an interview in terms of, you know, no, nothing gets 100 percent of us, whether it's our, our spouse, our children, our job, nothing. And because we're so busy trying to give 100 percent to everything, that's why our mental health is so fragile because we exactly. are overworking ourselves. We're expecting exactly. too much of ourselves. Exactly and so right. if you can give your kid or whoever 30%, fine, and give 100% of that 30%. Yes, that's the key. Yes, yes. I that's love the mental it. gymnastics, right? That's the mental gymnastics. You yes. know, and so it allows me to realize, you know what, there are some times I'm not a great mom or sometimes I don't feel like I'm a great daughter or friend. Yes. But over time, I'm a great daughter, a great friend because it's in my allocation. And it gives so you free now. now. I feel so yes. free. You should exactly everyone says that because then just like yes. your portfolio, I'm responding to the market condition. So when my children need more of me, I allocate that up. But I also right. know that I had to allocate something else down. And that right. allows me to say no, Sean. So that when yeah. my mentorship allocation is high and someone asks me for one more meeting on mentorship, I have to say no, because if I give you that, I have taken the allocation away from something else. Yes, yes, yes. You have freed a lot of people <laughs> with that word to Shonda. Okay, just a couple of minutes left. I, I just want to talk about the skill sets that you have that yeah. have uh, contributed to your success. Number one, you know, you, your positivity is just so infectious. I mean, you really just, just talking to you, I get more encouraged and I get more excited, but what are the skill sets yeah. that you think you have learned along the way that have really 
uh, been crucial to the fact that you have been so successful in your career? Well, for me, you know, I've connected my purpose in all that I do. I want to inspire and make positive impact. And for this around financial inclusion um, and retiring of people with dignity, the skill sets that I think I possess is I'm intellectually curious. Um, it's all not just in the first question, but the second and the third, which means that I'm open to say what I don't know. Um, I think it's important that we realize that the more you move up, the more you become of service. I'm a servant leader. You know, I am here to serve on behalf of. Um, I think it's very important to make sure that you continue to build your confidence. And it's always building because there's moments that I am insecure. There's moments where I do not feel like, you know, I'm, I'm good enough. And so I have to always be building my confidence and affirming myself. Um, I think you have to have empathy. I think, you know, the more that you move up, the more responsibility you have, never lose empathy the ability to connect and the ability to have perspective, other people's perspective. Um, and then lastly, you know, I'd say, Sean, recognize it's not all about you. It is a we thing. Um, you know, I could not be where I am without a whole bunch of prayer warriors, without a whole bunch of people affirming me, without people encouraging me, without people telling me that I don't belong. You know, the negativity also has helped me. And so I just think that, in order to, to be successful, you have to be clear on your purpose and mission, do your job with excellence, never compromise your character, and recognize that intellectual curiosity, empathy, and a real focus on outcomes uh, mm -hmm. will allow you to continue to make progress, um, is at least you know for me. And I think I'm still on a journey. I'm not done yet. I'm Wonderful. still trying to make impact. How do you know when it's time to make a job change? Oh, wow. Yeah. When... That's a great question. Yeah. So, you know, I was talking to my coach. Everyone needs a coach, right? Um, and so the way in which she shared this with me was it's like a container. And when you first jump into that container, you can't touch the ceiling. It's wide. You're just learning. You're moving. But then there comes a point where it feels like if you lift your head, you're hitting the ceiling. If you stretch out, you're hitting the ceiling, which means you love the container. There's nothing wrong with the container, but you're starting to outgrow the container. And so I think that for all of us, regardless of the role or position, ask yourself, am I starting to hunch my shoulders down in mm -hmm. my role? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that if you see that you're starting to hunch or you're starting to dim your light or you can't express yourself because it's not being heard anymore, it may be time for a new container. No judgment. It's just a new container. Um, and then lastly, I would say um, make sure that when you think about the taking a next job or next position, what do you want to get out of it? Um, because you don't want to just shift because maybe you're going through a hard bout or maybe your manager isn't the best. Maybe you need to work through that a little bit and get a little bit of grit and know how to navigate those tough waters. But on the other hand, if you're not stepping out because of your confidence or you believe that, you know, what if I fail or you don't think you're good enough or you don't think you're ready, go for it. Like, yes. go for it. Um, and so I, I think for me, it's about when do I feel like I am not able to add maximum value or impact. When do I feel like I'm not growing as much, but also being honest with myself and saying, what contributions have I provided so that yeah. I'm not moving so quickly without yet delivering real value. So that's how yeah. I think about it. President Biden appointed you to the Board of Advisors on Historically Black Colleges and Universities. Uh, as a graduate of Spelman College, I was so happy to hear that. Uh, briefly tell us, what is the mission of the board? Yeah, well, first, it's a privilege and an honor to be of service um, and to do all that I can uh, with some phenomenal leaders around the table. Uh, and really, the, the role is to provide insight and feedback on what can uh, the White House do to make sure that HBCUs thrive, that HBCUs excel, um, and making sure that we're asking not just from a matter of policy, but what can we do in the corporate setting, recognize the impact that HBCUs have made, but also some of the challenges that they have. And so how do we you know, provide recommendations, whether it's around technology, broadband, 
whether it's about investing in infrastructure, making sure they have quality buildings, best in class technology. How do we make sure that you know individuals going to and through HBCUs don't have the level of debt, knowing that many may come from under-resourced families? Um, how do we make sure that we're giving them access to internships while they're in school so they can have a great trajectory to be the next CEO of companies? And so it's about listening and it's about providing the White House with recommendations on what they can do to create good policy or to do more uh, for something that I think is one of our crown jewels of our country, which is you know historically black colleges and universities. Yes. Uh, you and your husband have four children. Uh, do you give them allowance of what are their financial responsibilities? <laughs> yeah, they, you know, um, two of them do. One's grown, my bonus. One's, you know, six. Um, and then I have a 14 and a 16 year old. But they have their own account. They get $25 a week. <laughs> $25. Okay. Um, and that's if they deliver. If their character is not right, they don't get paid. <laughs> um, but I do think it's important for them to have responsibility and to understand the importance of a dollar. And like my dad says, people see our glory, but they don't know our story. And yeah. so it's important for me that my children grow up and to, to understand that we work really hard um, to provide for them. Um, and that they understand what that means, because it, it's different, Sean, when, when it's coming out of their account. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's important to make sure that if they have goals, they should set the goal and twenty five dollars at a clip. They, too, can accomplish anything that they want financially. So, yeah, right. it's very important that they have financial uh, responsibility. Absolutely. You are the CEO of TIAA, the uh, a Fortune 100 company. You have uh, an extremely busy schedule so many employees to make sure you know their day is going right and to make sure your clients are served how do you take time off what do you do to relax and decompress and just restore your mental health yeah i mean my family is everything you know um i have just a, a wonderful husband and children and you know mom and dad and brothers and so you know i get to watch football with them, watch basketball with them. Uh, my husband and I play games together. Um, just be present, you know, go to the movies, get your nails done, go on dates with my son and my daughter uh, and spend time with my sisterhood. You know, I think the reality is we all need a village. And, yeah. you know, I think that we all need a village where you can, you know, share your vulnerabilities that you can say, I don't feel good today, or I'm going through something really tough. And that there's people that you know are cheering for you, but also will remind you who you are and remind you that it's okay to take a break. So I like reading books. I like being by myself. Um, I like the spa time and I like spending time with my family and with great, you know, humans, which many times are some great guys and girls that are part of my sisterhood and my brotherhood that really affirm me. That's wonderful. Tashonda, I am so happy to talk to you today. I have been waiting for this day for so long. Your team has been great. And I just, uh, you have dropped some gems. I Man, I keep thinking about this. I, why am I trying to give 100% to every, like, I don't have, I just have 100%. You get 30, you get, to, <laughs> you get some, and I will be present when I when I am talking to this person or doing this particular task. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you for freeing me up. And I could see so many uh, great comments from our, from our viewers. Thank you for sharing, great conversation, dope interview, everything. I love it. I absolutely well, I just want to thank you, Sean, for providing me the opportunity to speak to your viewers. And I know you said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very positive human and I have no choice. You know, I believe that the future, better days are always in front of us, not behind yeah. us. And I know that we're all heavy, whether it's your job, whether it's your work, personal life, et cetera. But just take that breath, know that you belong, know that your voice is necessary and required, um, and know that progress is always in front of us. So we should always stay hopeful and surround ourselves with people that can remind us of that when we're all going through our down times, for sure. Wonderful. Thanks so much, my friend. I really appreciate you. Have a Thank wonderful so day and hope to see you soon. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh my God. Wasn't she amazing? I told you. Wasn't she amazing, everybody? I love, I love, oh, Stacey, you said, oh, you work at TIA. That's great. 
Um, great discussion. Let's see. What are some of the comments I have here? Okay. Great interview. Love that. Great discussion. Um, thank you so much. Wonderful. Let's see. Thanks, mom. Mom says great interview. Thank you, mom. I love this. I love this. This is so wonderful. I'm glad you guys uh, enjoyed that. She was dropping some gems, wasn't she? Okay. Whew. I feel so free. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, tell your friends about this interview. It will be, uh, obviously we're posting the interview and so they can come on here and check it out. Um, see what we talked about. Um, tell everybody about the wonderful discussions, the pearls of wisdom that that uh, Tashonda was dropping today. Um, we want to get as many people as possible to uh, to check out the interview. Okay, everybody, I will see you later. Thank you. Bye bye.